My name is Antonio Candela. Thank you very much uh, for, for the presentation, uh, Marvin. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a functional nutritionist uh, certified to, uh, to carry out the Bredesen protocol uh, since uh, 2020. Um, uh, with this presentation, I'm going to illustrate the possible arrangements and protocols based on the new radiant 1070 nanometer plus for two clients, one with Alzheimer's disease and the other with traumatic brain injury. The protocols were tailored for these clients according to, to their brain maps and their symptoms, so it might not be generalized to others. Let's start with the case of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, on April 14, uh, 2022, a 72-year-old woman with uh, her husband came to my office uh, and uh, she reported to have cognitive decline. Uh, so first of all, I carried out a Montreal cognitive assessment and uh, she scored uh, 15. Her medical history after uh, a, a questionnaire re revealed the following. So, headaches, arthritis, depression, five dental amalgams, gut issues with bloating and uh, some constipation. Um, I uh, started to apply the Bredesen protocol and uh, so first of all uh, I suggest different tests. Uh, this is the baseline lab panel. I reported here some of the parameters that were uh, suboptimal or completely abnormal. First of all, uh, she had one copy of the gene APOE4. For those who are not familiar with this uh, uh, gene, uh, this can uh, increase inflammation and can uh, uh, maximize the absorption of glucose and uh, the lipidic component. Um, she had just one copy, so if the other one is uh, working well, uh, there is no problem. Uh, and um, you have to consider that two copies of this gene can increase the likelihood to uh, get Alzheimer's disease of the uh, 60%. Um, her uh, serum level of uh, albumin, glutathione and vitamin C were suboptimal. Um, however, uh, the um, had glucose serum was uh, okay, was 90, was in the range, there was no insulin resistance, uh, the, the, the value is 7.2, so just a, a little bit above the, the, the threshold. Um, the hemoglobin A1C was 5.5, uh, so there was not a problem of the glycemia, there was not a hypometabolism in this brain. Um, aromocysteine level was 10 micromolar, we considered well between 4 and 7, so was slightly up. However, she had a deficit in the uh, hormonal balance with the, the DEA and the estradiol serum very low. Now you have to consider that she's a 72-year-old woman, so we expect a low level of these hormones, although uh, these are very extremely low levels. And, uh, uh, and then um, potassium, the, the red blood cell magnesium was quite low, and uh, copper and zinc were a little bit uh, lower than the, than the threshold. So the, these were the baseline lab panel where there were some, some deficits. And uh, uh, because uh, um, this woman had five dental amalgams, first of all, I suggest some tests that could uh, assess the heavy metal toxicity. And uh, here I show two of these tests. One is the tree test, which measure the level of mercury in blood, in urine, and in hair. Uh, here you have uh, the level of uh, methyl mercury. This one is an inorganic mercury, and this one is the sum of the two. You can see that the level of methyl mercury, the one that comes from food, it's uh, a little bit higher, while the inorganic mercury was uh, was. I mean, it was slightly higher, but still compared to the, this is the quicksilver control, the bar in gray, and uh, uh, it was, uh, let's say, in the range. And uh, this was the, the total amount. So there was a, a slight toxicity of, uh, of mercury. Um, here, from the urine, uh, we want to uh, assess the, the, the excretion ability. So on the x-axis here, you have the, the level of blood mercury 
the higher this level, the higher to be the, the excretion ability. So they want to stay close to the line, okay? Here in the urine, the level of, uh, of mercury was, uh, uh, I mean, uh, was um, in the blood was, uh, was, the, was this level, but uh, the excretion was uh, almost on the line. The problem is that when we measure the one in the hair, you can see that the, the, the level of mercury was higher here and the excretion was uh, suboptimal. So there was uh, a, a mercury toxicity. Uh, another thing to consider is that this is a window uh, of three months. So if there was a, a previous intoxication, you cannot have a, an entire uh, perspective. Um, here, you, um, there is uh, another assessment, the, 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 the one on blood, but just of different heavy metals. So antimony, arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury. And, and you can see that the level of uh, uh, arsenic uh, is in the blood is uh, much higher even than the one from, uh, from mercury. So this was a case of a heavy metal intoxication. Uh, I also suggest a metabolomic profile. With, with this test, we can um, uh, quantify the level of some metabolites in the urine and go back to the level of some uh, yeast, bacteria, but also to the level of, uh, uh, for example, neurotransmitter like dopamine, norepinephrine, uh, serotonin. And this test is uh, uh, really good also to uh, evaluate the level of uh, some marker for the function of mitochondria. Now I reported the, the, the um, abnormal level. And here you can see that the level of fusarium, this is a, a mold species were very high. And also arabinose and arabitol, the two levels were extremely high. These two metabolites are metabolites that, ca that come from candida. Okay, so she had a candida toxicity in the gut and also some mold. And uh, the level of uh, other two uh, markers, uh, uh, epuric and benzoic acid, were uh, quite high. And these are markers for bacteria. Last, uh, air level of dopamine were, were very low. So the plan was to start a nutritional program, the KetoFlex diet, uh, with the intermittent fasting to minimize the intake of inflammatory proteins. Uh, I suggest a, a list of supplements to optimize our lab values and improve gut, kidney, and liver function to prepare our body to the detox phase. Um, she, uh, on my suggestion, purchased an, an infrared sauna because the infrared sauna um, maximizes the ability to uh, excrete the toxins from the blood because uh, uh, utilizes another uh, another path, uh, in addition to uh, stool and urine, we have the sweat that, and uh, uh, she could use the sweat to uh, maximize the excretion of toxins. However, there were different, diff several issues with this because uh, they didn't have space in the flat, so they couldn't buy a sauna uh, with in wood. Uh, which is more um, reliable, but uh, they opted for a blanket infrared sauna that didn't work properly, properly, or at least they couldn't manage to make it work efficiently. And uh, I suggest the removal of dental amalgams because we know that with time, amalgams release mercury. 50% are composed of, uh, uh, the, the quantity of mercury is 50% in each amalgam, and with time, you can have a leakage. But they, she didn't want to remove them, also on suggestion of uh, her husband, because uh, you remember the level of inorganic mercury were still in the range, so uh, she decided to postpone. I suggest physical activity when possible, in this case with long walks, and uh, uh, to carry out exercises for cognitive stimulation on the Apollo Health platform because they signed in the platform so they could take uh, either a test to monitor cognitive status or uh, exercise to stimulate cognition. After six months of treatment, 
when I repeated the Monshell cognitive assessment, she went from 15 to 13. So she was uh, uh, declining. She kept declining. Uh, at this point, the husband started to worry and um, her level of anxiety went a little bit up. So I decided to um, to start for biomodulation. I suggest them to start the for biomodulation protocol so that we could have uh, more weapons to to use to stop the decline and maybe try to improve. This uh, uh, 13 is already a uh, an advanced stage of dementia. And uh, so we start for the biomodulation protocol in collaboration with Marvin. Um, removal of dental amalgams. They decided to to get in touch with the with the dentist who could apply a procedure, a safe procedure, to remove the amalgams. Because if they don't go to a dentist who is uh, uh, skilled uh, during the procedure. Uh, you can risk to have uh, a, a higher leakage of uh, of mercury in the in the organism. Then um, we went on with the low detox without infrared so on a blanket uh, because uh, this was creating some problem. She also took some sessions of uh, intravenous ozone therapy because I'm collaborating with another doctor who is doing ozone therapy, and uh, I also suggest them to purchase an IQR with a HEPA filter to clean air from mold spores, because uh, in, the, in their apartment, there was the presence of some uh, mold spores, because uh, I made them track this with some dishes with agar, and uh, it was light, it was, I mean, just uh, um, not that intense, but uh, there, there were some. Now I'm going to show you the comparison between the QEG that we took in November 2022 and the QEG that we took in May 2023, so after six months. This is the QEG with the eyes closed. You know that the, the, the first feature when you measure a QEG with eyes closed is an alpha, a posterior alpha here that she was missing. She was reported also from the doctor that uh, carried out the, the QEG and uh, she didn't have a, any alpha, but she had a, a very strong, very uh, high amplitude uh, theta. Um, but uh, you can see that after six months of treatment of stimulation, um, the, the alpha rhythm improved. And uh, this was reported by the doctor after that she took the QEG, that this time when she closed the eyes, there was a, a, a more prominent presence of the alpha rhythm. And you can see here also the, the amplitude of theta was starting to, to decrease. This is the relative power. So we have now a, uh, a, a more balanced amplitude of theta. Also the, the, the coherence, the, this was a, a low coherence that improved slightly here. Uh, here I show the, the uh, QEG uh, with the open eyes, and uh, uh, you can still you can still see that the the theta rhythm, the amplitude of theta, is uh, was uh, very strong at the beginning. Now it's uh, a little bit less. It's still present, but uh, it's uh, less intense. And um, here I show the relative power with the different frequencies. You can see that the, the, the frequencies of five, six, and seven had a really strong theta amplitude. And um, I want to make the comparison, especially with the, with the seven hertz frequency. You can see that uh, here, this is a much better scenario compared to this one. Also, there was uh, a, a delta here, which uh, was, uh, was very low. Here is uh, slightly improved. So after six months, when I repeated the, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment of May 2023, she went from 13 to 19. She improved of six points, but uh, the client improved her level of concentration, attention and reasoning. She was confirmed, this was confirmed also by the husband, also he reported less anxiety that she, she had. 
but the conversion of shorter memories to long-term memories remains impaired. So there is still a problem of uh, uh, memory consolidation. And uh, uh, we know that uh, 19 is still um, playing dementia. So we still have a, a long uh, run to go, but uh, it's uh, uh, this is already something that uh, it's not easy to make it happen. Because as you saw before, the, she went from 15 to 13. And now with many, many intervention, uh, we were able to not only stop the decline, but give her some, uh, some kind of benefit. And uh, now I'm going to show you the, the, the PBM stimulation settings, what we did to, uh, with the, uh, after that we saw the QEG. So we started with um, 40 hertz stimulation everywhere. So left, right, front and back for with the three minutes in the morning, 75% intensity. This was for the first three days. Then we uh, we continued with this stimulation. We just increased time. So we went from three minutes in the morning to three minutes in the morning, three minutes in the in the afternoon. Then six minutes in the morning, six minutes in the afternoon from day seven to day eleven. Nine minutes in the morning, nine minutes in the afternoon for other ten days. And then we came to 12, we, we, we still were increasing, and uh, we went to 12 in the morning, 12 in the afternoon. But after one day at this stimulation, at uh, 75% intensity, after two sessions, uh, her anxiety increased. She started to report some, uh, some, some anxiety. So we uh, switched the, the, the stimulation, we changed the stimulation, and we went to 14, uh, 14 hertz still, everywhere in uh, uh, with six minutes in the morning while in the afternoon uh, we stimulated at 10 hertz for three minutes 75 percent intensity and this uh, uh, was uh, this went on for for one week uh, then uh, the, the 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 scenario was uh, was kind of starting to uh, was starting to improve. So um, I decided for the uh, for the long run maintain maintenance. Uh, I decided we decided to uh, switch uh, the um, I mean take four steps and uh, try to stimulate with the, uh, the temporal lobe and then the frontal and the occipital lobe in, in a different way. So this was the stimulation, 15 and 16, uh, left, right, 16 and 15, two minutes, two minutes. Then 15, 16, front, back, and 16, 15 for other four minutes. So it was a eight minute total in the morning at 50% intensity for the remaining four months so for more for four months she stimulated in this way so this was a, a uh, let's say a, a stimulation that was a, um, a medium stimulation with uh, uh, alternating the temporal and the frontal and occipital and in the afternoon the, the, the total time was the same, eight minutes, but in the afternoon she uh, stimulated in nine and ten the temporal, ten and nine, four minutes, and uh, the other four minutes, ten and nine, uh, front back, nine and ten, front back. And uh, yes, this was the, the, the afternoon stimulation. Okay, so this is uh, uh, what we did for the for the for the six months, and uh, yes, this is uh, uh, the end of this case. Now I don't know if you have any question related to to this. Uh, maybe I can take another question, or if you prefer, I don't know, Marvin, how you want to do. I can maybe uh, continue with the other case, and then at the end you want to ask questions. Well, the only thing I wanted to add was I because I really want to just underscore the the smart decision to move toward dealing with the coherence by doing the alternating left and right front and back that we mm -hmm. saw in the, in the change in coherence that there was then an increase in the hyper coherence 
which then was mitigating some of the hypocoherence. So mm -hmm. clearly, this was a shift from one extreme to in another extreme, if you will, and that what we need to do now is start working toward, you know, modulating down, but maintaining that idea of continuing to stimulate the bilateral and the front back coherence. And that's what, what we did with this was just, it was very effective using a very low level of intensity. So I think this is a great, a great teaching opportunity and a learning opportunity about yes, protocol exactly. design related to coherence. It was great, thank you. Just a quick question. Yes. But, uh, was that programmable, Marvin, to just to, 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 would it go from step one to step two to step three to step yeah, that's, four? Automatically yeah, that, that's, program that in. Yeah, that's the design of the 4Q. That's why people have the 4Q. Gotcha, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of new to this, so bear with me as I'm struggling through it. What is the uh, sort of diagnostic procedure that gets you to determine 75% versus 50% or 24 minutes versus eight minutes? How do you, how do you decide how to set the intensity and the duration? What is it in the queue or, or the patient's reacting? What are you seeing that makes you oh, figure that yeah. out? The, the considerations, I think, as, as Antonio wisely picked up, was the idea of managing her anxiety, that there was this, this over arousal potential, which I think is because of the very fragile system that we're working with, because there was some significant levels of toxicity, which you know the functional medicine is eminently capable of identifying, and then they can address it in their way, but that's not necessarily going to deal necessarily with the broader psychiatric emotional you know challenges that somebody's experiencing in the moment that decreasing the the toxicity is going to produce the long term effect but in the moment if we can do something about mitigating that with photobiomodulation and if you have neurofeedback capability clearly these are the kind of things that neurofeedback can much much more rapidly intervene on and support the photobiomodulation in affecting. So yes, we have to use yes. what we know, John. We have to use that along with what I, Antonio and Jan knew what they understand. Yes, and and then Marvin, uh, the, uh, I will add that there, there is also an individual response. For example, here when we uh, uh, went to uh, twelve minutes in the morning and twelve in the afternoon at seventy-five percent, and uh, uh, she had after these two sessions, she had uh, an increase in anxiety. It, it means that uh, this this type of stimulation for her was too much. So this was a, a clear sign that we were overstimulating. So it also depends on the feedback that uh, we receive uh, from that person because uh, still there is a, a subjectivity. Some each individual is different. Maybe another individual would uh, ke would have kept without problem this stimulation, but she had problem with this stimulation. So when uh, when we understand that, we went back and uh, when I had to go in the long run to avoid overstimulation. Uh, we, we decided to go with the, with the 50 percent intensity because this was a, a, a stimulation that she will do on a daily basis so i decided to go uh moderately so to have a, a better outcome yeah and okay, we're I've talking got, about we're talking about a very very small alteration in the stimulation which you know what i mean like 25 percent of the duty cycle is not a hell of a lot of difference but it is significant to someone when they're doing this repeated kind of intervention okay i, I guess i, I <laughs> again my frame is a little bit i'm missing something here in other words going back to your prior slide would it have been uh, an alternate uh, thought process to say why don't we reduce the intensity to 50 or 25 and maintain the same duration is that a, a what that's I think what I'm trying to figure out is how do you discern no it's we're going to change frequencies completely we're going to move away from 40 and start doing the you know bilateral front and back at different frequencies versus sticking with something that you seem to be getting some traction with but reduce the intensity 
I don't know how to make that judgment. Help help me understand that. Th those are the kind of questions that we need to address as clinicians. How would we go about doing that? I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. I think that um, Antonio is going based on his understanding of the QEEG. My uh, contributions in consultation with them were not really that frequent, right? So I just said, yeah. go ahead, and, you know, go ahead and do what you know how to do. And how would you, how would you intervene? And this is what you know Antonio came up with. And I wanted, I wanted him to lean into his strong suit. Yeah. Whereas you and I would, you and I would probably lean into going the other way. Uh, no, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not saying that there's any right or wrong in this. I obviously no, no, no. much more experimentation is needed to get a larger yeah, yeah. data set. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, yeah, and you, you and I would lean probably in just decreasing the intensity and letting it go at that. However, because I was giving Antonio feedback about, you know, the coherence issues can really yeah. be. A, a significant underlying driver for the anxiety and for the cognitive issues. Why don't we look at doing the bilateral coherence training, which Antonio was just learning how to do. Yeah. So, you know, this is, it's kind of like my decision-making around training the trainer and also managing the case, working yeah. on, you know, improving. So it's like a double-edged thing. Right. Well, well I, I, listen, Antonio, I really appreciate your contribution here. This is amazing. It was amazing to watch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, not a, you not about the neuro, uh, using the neuronic, but about managing this particular patient, uh, because this is exactly the people that I see all day, every day. Um, you've got mm -hmm. to go after that arsenic. It, the mercury is a red herring. The arsenic... Okay. Okay. Use Quicksilver's advanced push catch protocol. You can monitor it by using Dr. Schumacher's VCS every four weeks and give her a frontal cortex exercise to do. And this is what I do. Um, have her read out loud to her spouse two to no more than five minutes a day. And immediately after doing that, she has to discuss what she's just read. That will work on her, her immediate short-term working memory. Great. And you can do it while she's wearing the neuronic. Make Great. her okay. read out loud because reading out loud is a much different motor function than reading to yourself. And reading to someone else is different than just reading out loud. And she hears herself read. She works on her phasia. She also has to immediately recall. So he can either ask her questions about what she just read. And I'll tell you a great thing to read are recipes. Hmm. Oh, that, 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 that's a recipes really have specific, They have uh, specific ingredients and they have yeah. a particular order in which things have to be done. Way to go, hmm. Garland. So, like I said, I'd like to know more about the frequencies and stuff to use, but that's how you, that that arsenic, and if she wants to know where the arsenic came from, it could very well have been in the groundwater where she lived at one point in her life. Yes, yes, I know. And I, I also spoke about yeah. that, yes. Okay. Great yeah, thank Carolyn. you, thank you. It was a great suggestion, thank you. Okay, uh, so next case, uh, a case of uh, traumatic brain injury. Uh, this is a 28-year-old girl with uh, a TBI and cerebral edema because of car accident in January 2015. She showed compulsive behavior aspects, severely impaired working memory, and uh, her mother reports children-like behavior. Um, the, the therapeutic plan was uh, to put her on, uh, on a low-carb diet with a good quantity of vegetables, although um, few cruciferous for her because of CBS and SUOX gene polymorphism. These two genes, if you have a polymorphism in these two genes, uh, you are not able to 
to process the sulfite in uh, cruciferous vegetables. So uh, you have to be cautious. And uh, so, uh, I also added uh, a good amount of uh, healthy fats. Uh, a list of supplements to optimize blood flow, lymphatic system, and increase the amount of growing factors. This is important for uh, brain plasticity. Brain plasticity. So BDNF and GF, GDNF, and um, the, the the PBM protocol uh, still with Marvin. We we followed uh, together. I, I I have to say I learned a lot on this case thanks to Marvin. Um, and um, this is the eyes closed. Uh, QEG, uh, November 2022, March 2023. Uh, you can see here, this is the spot where the, the she had the brain trauma. And um, you can immediately see there is an hypercoherence here at the high beta. And uh, after the, the period of stimulation, this was the, the result. So this, uh, this uh, hypercoherence just went away. And uh, this was really a nice result, even because uh, we were not expecting these at all. Then at the end, I will, I will tell you why. And um, and uh, this is the, this is the QEG with uh, with open eyes. You can see the same. There is this uh, this hypercoherence, the high beta, and uh, after the treatment, after the, the stimulation, uh, this is a clear improvement um now i just uh, want to emphasize the the hypercoherence at the different frequencies uh, especially this was at uh, high beta 25 30 hertz and uh, at uh, between 18 and 25 these were the frequencies where she uh, had the, the this uh, this hypercoherence and uh, here is uh, the result after the simulation so what was the the pbm stimulation setting with the with there we we started with the 40 hard stimulation three minutes in the afternoon followed by two minutes in uh, uh, with the stimulation uh, with the eight hertz left 15 hertz right and then 15 eight for other, for other two minutes so a total of seven minutes stimulation 75 percent intensity this was for one week when we met her again after one week she feels she felt pressure on the front after five minutes stimulation this is what the the mom reported so we changed the stimulation and we stopped it at three minutes at 40 hertz just uh, with the front and the back at 75 percent intensity for one week after that week, she had difficulty with, with sleeping and at night. She, she already actually had a little bit of difficulty sleeping at night, but uh, uh, she reported that uh, was having even more a more hard time sleeping. So um, we changed again the stimulation and uh, we kept the front back at 40 hertz for three minutes in the afternoon, 75%. But then at night, uh, at 9 p.m., we had a three minute of six hertz stimulation on, uh, on all the brain and uh, three hertz stimulation at 10 p.m. So three minutes, 9 p.m., six hertz stimulation everywhere, three minutes at uh, 10 p.m. Uh, everywhere, 75% as sleep improves. But she feels a bit dazed in the morning. So the stimulation that we were giving at night to improve sleep worked, but uh, in the morning she felt a little bit dazed. So we, in the morning, we, we changed again the, the, the stimulation. In the morning, we went with the, an energized program, three minutes. In the morning, 75% for one week and uh, uh, six minutes in the afternoon at 14 hertz, 75%. We still were stimulating at 9, at uh, 6 hertz, 3 minutes at 9 p.m., and the 3 hertz, 3 minutes at 10 p.m. After uh, another week, she reports worsening following the stimulation. Uh, her mom um, said that uh, immediately after the stimulation, the, the time period that followed the stimulation, she didn't feel very well. So 
this was a great insight of, of Marvin, we started a, a placebo stimulation for another week to understand whether it was because uh, during the, the discussion with the mom, it came, came up that there were some psychological aspects to, to keep track of. And uh, she was also referring to a kinesiologist and to other doctor with where there were different supplements that they were giving to her. So uh, we decided, this was a, a suggestion of Marvin, that decided to, to do a placebo stimulation. So um, we, we didn't shed light, but she was uh, still wearing the, the helmet for uh, three minutes in the morning and uh, three minutes in the in the afternoon. So um, she reports she she still reports worsening after the stimulation, although we didn't shed light. So the mother starts to understand that different aspects might trigger the discomfort her daughter was feeling, and the, uh, either psychological aspect or those related to the supplement that she was taking. She was inclined to return the device. But when she saw the QEG, because then we suggest to first take the map again, the, the QEG, to understand what was going on. And that's when we realized that actually we were, we were having uh, great results with the, with the stimulation. So she understood that uh, this was not a problem of stimulation and uh, she kept stimulating. And after two weeks, she started to notice, it, to notice some cognitive improvements with the uh, um with their daughter so uh, at the end she didn't decide uh, to to return the the helmet and actually this turned in a in a good uh, in a happy ending so this is the the end of the of the presentation and if you have uh, any questions on this please ask